And I would like uh, to welcome, thanks, Van, for coming. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. I'm going to get right into a song. What if the whole world was made out of water? We'd be swimming in yesterday's hour. And I've seen my share of good rivers And they all have that same sacred power A river is yesterday's rain Staring it echoes again I squint my eyes and strain Staring at rivers of rain Will it be in me up in old Pulaski? Salmon River and a treble hook try. In New York, the waters roll cold. A fish on and the stories are told. Arkansas, the White River it foam. Batesville and Noah's Ark home. My first trout west of the Mississippi. My last trout west of the Mississippi. A river is yesterday's rain. Staring it echoes again And I squint my eyes and strain Staring at rivers of rain North of Boise, the rage in Payette Mountain Mill, as wild as it gets The main fort down to Horseshoe Bend A close call for a dear, dear friend I've caught eels on the tar in Carolina. I hooked a gator in the other Carolina. But all the rivers I've seen in this land, ah, there's only one Susquehanna. Oh, rivers of yesterday's rain, I'm staring at echoes again. And I squint my eyes and strain, staring. I always like starting with a song. Oh, here, you can get fancy if you want to feel normal. I think there's like an applause emoji or something you might be able to do. Maybe not. Yeah, reactions. Here, I'm going to applause for myself. Look at that. It just feels normal, folks. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, I am broadcasting here from Montour County, Pennsylvania. So welcome to Danville, Pennsylvania. I do teach in Lewisburg, and it's, it's thrilling to see so many folks from the Lewisburg community logging in. So... Thanks, Karen, and a few others who I saw. Um, <clears throat> what I thought we would do tonight is, you know, this was advertised as being eel-focused. So I certainly want to focus on the eels and eel dams, and I think that's what brought me to your group. But I'd like to touch on a few other topics that I think you'll find of interest as well. My, my goal is to stay under an hour total. So uh, we started at 7. I'll try to wrap things up by 8. Um, so if you're curious what the schedule is, that's what I'm shooting for. So why don't we get right into the next song, and then I'm going to show you some pictures of uh, what's going on with eels in the Susquehanna River and what's going on in my classroom with eels in the Susquehanna River. This is going to be a song uh, in the style called Talking Blues. If you're a Bob Dylan fan, you've heard Talking Blues. If you're a Woody Guthrie fan, that's where Bob Dylan heard the Talking Blues. And Woody didn't necessarily come up with it. In fact, this, this style of song that you're about to hear is traced back to um, African-American musicians from the 1890s era uh, in Texas, West Texas. Uh, musicologists have traced the talking blues back to them. And um, I use this style all the time. I love it. It's three chords, which is my kind of song. And uh, you kind of tell a story over top of it. And there's usually what Woody Guthrie called some zingers in there. It's kind of got... Sometimes a little political zinger. I promise I'm not going to get too political on you, but uh, listen for it. You know, you can get a message across really nicely with a little sense of humor. That's what these songs do. This is called Talking Eel and Shad Blues. <laughs> Oh, 
Come on, you fishermen and river rats. Let's talk about eels and talk about shad. Migratory fish need a river that's free. They gotta have access to the sea. Baby eels swimming up. Baby shad swimming down. Bring them back. Hey, bring back the shad. Bring them back. The eels bring them back. Now that trouble started a century ago. We dammed the river and we blocked the flow. From then on, the migration was done and the eels died off one by one. I've heard stories of a few old timers still catching them in the 1970s. Holdouts. Now eels can live over 50 years. They swim up river and they live around here. Native people would catch them in the fall, smoke them, dry them, protein for all. You can still see the eel dams in the river. They're shaped like a giant V. Bring them back. Hey, bring back the shad. Bring them back. The eels bring them back. Eels ain't snakes, eels are fish. Smoked eel is a mighty fine dish. Shad, I like to smoke them too. Try it sometime, it'll grow on you. Omega 3s and whatnot. Now the Lehigh, Schuylkill, and Delaware have shad and eels everywhere. Their rivers are free without dams, and that's what we need on the Susquehanna. Who do we think we are to block a river? Moses? Bring them back. Hey, bring back the shad, bring them back. The eels, bring them back. Little talking blues for you. I promised I won't get too political on you there, but. So, Let's get into uh, some quick pictures that'll add context to this story of eels. I'm gonna do some screen sharing here. And um, let me get my poster ready. Okay, friends, this is uh, a brief, but I introduce you some of my students and former students. Uh, I'm the guy in the wool rich coat. If you're not from Pennsylvania, that's what we call a Pennsylvania tuxedo. Um, but there are my advanced placement environmental science students. And we were the first school in the country to uh, partner with several state and federal agencies to raise eels in our classroom and then release them into creeks and rivers. And as, as you heard in that song, oh, in fact, let's make this, let's make this uh, participatory. Put it in the chat. Let me see. Was anyone listening in the song? How long can an eel live? It was in the song. How long can the eel live? I gotta, where's the chat? Well, I'll have to come back later and see your chat because I'm in screen share Joanne mode, sorry. Joanne right. said 100, Liz says, says 50 years. And, and great, thank you. You're, you're kind of all right. So the textbook answer is an eel can live 50 years. However, as you also heard in my song, I've met folks who said, well, I, I caught him in the 1970s, Van, and the last, the last of the dams was was built around World War One. So you do your math and that's a little bit older than 50 years. So it's possible that you can get, I think, older than 50, which is incredible, which is what one of the things that really interested me about this is you might have heard of trout in the classroom, which is a wonderful program. But, you know, at best, what are you going to get out of a trout a year or two, maybe three? Um, so I thought, wow, if we can start releasing a few dozen eels per year and each one could live 50 years, like this is, this is kind of exciting. So let's get into um, our, our eels. And this is something I should touch on. This is how eels were traditionally caught. Um, Native Americans would build these giant Vs in the Susquehanna, in the Delaware, all over the East Coast. And they're made out of rocks. And as you'll see in a, in a moment, the and some other pictures that I have prepared for you, these Vs are all over out there. What makes the Delaware River kind of unique is they're still functioning because they don't have dams on the Delaware River. And so you can go to Eastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey and you can still see people catching eels the traditional way. In fact, if you're familiar with a television show called Filthy Riches, they did a really cool special on a gentleman who catches eels and smokes them 
on the Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey border. He's kind of up in the Woodstock area, as I recall. He looks like he's from the Woodstock area. He's a pretty cool character. I like the guy. I can't recall his name right now. But if you do some Googling when we're done and just search uh, Filthy Riches, the TV show, and Eels, you might even be able to find the episode. It's excellent. But it shows how these worked. The eels would come down in the fall. Uh, they're freshwater fish. Uh, and they come down in the fall. They're on their way to the ocean. And this mechanism would catch them. And... Um, this is actually one of my favorite images to show my high school students because this is my childhood view. I grew up on a mountain in Danville, Pennsylvania. The mountain is called Montour Ridge, or the part I grew up on was called Bald Top Mountain. And looking out of our home on the edge of the mountain, this was kind of the view. This picture was actually taken from an airplane, but it was pretty cool. This airplane must have been right above our house because I have this image memorized. And if you look down in the valley in the Susquehanna River there, that is a man-made V. And ever since I was a young boy, dad just told me, that's an eel dam, that's an eel dam. You know, I Indians built that. And it's so ingrained in my brain that you just kind of grew up here on the Susquehanna River and, and you just knew about the eel dam and you knew, you know, went back to the Indians. Now, people in the 1800s and early 1900s were still using it. Um, but there is plenty of evidence that it was built possibly thousands of years ago. Um, and I don't want to get too bogged down in that date. So I'm just going to leave it open-ended and say possibly. As I said recently to my dad, I go, Dad, you know, I made, this, I made this video and I put it on YouTube suggesting that the Danville Eel Dam, it could be a few thousand years old. And I said, there's a couple people saying, can you prove that it is? And my dad is, a, my dad's actually an attorney. He's a good one. He said, ask them if they can prove it's not. So I like that. Um, and, and again, does it, does it really matter? I think we're splitting hairs here. It's a historic site for catching eels. Let's leave it at that. Um, these pictures were only recently given to me and to my local folks who are from the central Susquehanna Valley. This is actually somewhere near Shemokin Dam, Sealands Grove. Um, and as you can see, still, still functioning, still catching eels up through the 1950s and 60s. If you're from the Lewisburg, Williamsport, Seals Grove area, you might even remember that skyline. That power plant was is still there. They only recently converted it to natural gas, and they dynamited the uh, Schmokin Dam power plant smokestacks uh, last year and imploded them. Pretty awesome. Just showing you how this works. So that those slats would allow the water through, but the eels would, would get entangled and trapped in there. And check out these numbers. I apologize if you can't see everything. Um, I'll try and paraphrase. This came from a friend of mine here in Danville. And she was going over old newspaper clippings. And this is from 1912. Um, 50,000 eels caught just here in Danville. Uh, or forgive me, caught in Pennsylvania overall. Here in, in Danville, it says three tons of eels taken in 10 days. And there you can see the price. Uh, kids went up and down the street selling them. In fact, she said kids were known to, they would skip school in the fall because they could make more money going out and catching eels. I mean, look at that, 18 cents a pound if it's cleaned. Um, you could make more money than your dad working in the ironworks. Um, and I love that, the boys going up and down the street selling them, kind of a, a cool image. And this would have been a fall routine. Uh, so, so before folks of European ancestry uh, an African and Asian ancestry moving in, you know, this would have been what Native Americans were doing. They were catching them in the fall. This would have been a time of great celebration, uh, plenty of food. This is where our eels come from. They are caught below the Conowingo Dam. Um, so for those of you from the, the Maryland side of this, this program tonight, you're probably more familiar with this site than I am, but this is the first hurdle of five uh, that, that makes it difficult for the eels to come up and and back into their traditional range. Oh, and I should have started the program by pointing that out uh, because sometimes I get that program or that question. People say, why are your students stocking eels? Because they belong here. I should have started by just pointing out something that many of us don't even realize. Eels are a keystone species from Maryland and Pennsylvania, Virginia, New Jersey, uh, perhaps one of the most important fish. Uh, where did I just recently read a biomass estimate? Um, one of the biomass estimates I recently read, and I'm sorry I can't give a source, suggested that eels, actually it may have been in the Bay Journal. So if you're a Bay Journal reader, they recently did a story on eels. I think Ad Crable was the author uh, within the last few months. So if you have yours, and he said uh, there's evidence that the uh, greatest biomass in the whole Susquehanna River historically may have been eels. 
So this, this is not just a, a, a visiting fish. This was a very important species. Well, good. I'm going to get out of screen share and get back to some very important music for you all. Oh, look at all those answers coming in. And you heard the introduction. I'm a school teacher, so there'll be other quizzes. So be ready to answer in the chat. That worked out really nicely. All right. For the next song and story of the Susquehanna, I want to get uh, historic in the nature of the song choice and of the music choice. Don't get me wrong. The guitar is a lot of fun, but the guitar has only really been popular uh, in this area for what, 150 years? So the next instrument I'm going to share with you is the oldest string instrument on the planet. Now, not the one I have. I made the one I have, but it's called a mouth bow. And uh, perhaps if there's a silver lining to us being on Zoom tonight, I don't get to take this out when I perform live very often. Um, so before the pandemic, when I was doing concerts all over the East Coast, this often stayed at home because it's just too hard to mic. It's too hard to perform in front of several hundred people with this thing. So tonight, because you're here in my home with me, it's quiet enough you can hear this. Obviously, it's uh, oriented or, or uh, originated from a hunter's bow. There is a cave painting in France that has been carbon dated to, I believe, 12 to 14,000 years old. And it shows, it's, I think it's called the mystic hunter or mythical hunter. And the hunter is playing a mouth bow in the in the work. So I guess what I'm suggesting is uh, we, we think this was a musical instrument as long as 12 to 14,000 years ago. And... Uh, if you do anything with youth or with kids, you, you can make these. I mean, I am a woodworker, but I did not use my skills to make this. I, I had a green piece of oak in this case. Green let me bend it. And I just used uh, metal, but any, any twine or string works. And you hold it up to your mouth. You're not going to slobber all over. You're kind of holding it up to the outside of your mouth. And you pluck it. You can either pluck it with your finger or a stick. I'm going to use a guitar pick because that's what I'm used to. But listen to this sound. So I'm going to play more for you in a moment. I just wanted to give you a flavor for that. Doesn't that sound like the didgeridoo from Australia or something? This is what rang up and down the Susquehanna Valley around campfires. This is the sound. It wasn't guitars and banjos till recently. It was the mouth bow. And the music, the rhythm, everything about it was dictated by the sounds you could get from this thing. So I, I, uh, I'm going to play you a song, sing some lyrics to it. And I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll stop talking so loud so that if you want to turn your microphone up or your speakers up so you can hear this thing, I'll sing on the quiet side so that you can really hear this thing. Here we go. Catch a fish on the Susquehan, catch a fish on the Susquehan, catch a fish on the Susquehan, I sit on the bank in the mud and the sand. Wade right in up to your knees, wade right in up to your knees, wade right in up to your knees, don't go in the winter, you might freeze. Catch them on a hook if you can, catch them on a hook. Yeah. Cast your lure, sit and float, cast your lure and sit and float. Cast your lure and sit and float, have no lure, jump in the boat. Catch a fish in the Susquehan, catch a fish in the Susquehan, catch a fish in the Susquehan. Mud in the sand. <laughs> you may want to turn your speakers down. Everybody, loud unmute. Everybody unmute. Let's give a round of applause for that. <laughs> um, <woo! laughs> awesome. So here, 
That was cool. Here's what we'll do. Let's go a few things and uh, we can come back and revisit this. Maybe what I'll do is just a few minutes before eight o'clock, I'll give time for questions and things. So I think it'll, we'll have more flow if, if, uh, if I keep going with my train of thought. Um, thanks so much. One thing that's for sure, we're probably the only Zoom meeting in the country at this time uh, featuring the mouth bow. Uh, it's a historic instrument. You know, all of our ancestors played it. It doesn't matter what continent your genes come from. All of our ancestors played the mouth bow. And uh, it's the only known stringed instrument played by Native Americans in North America at the time of uh, European and African arrival. Um, it, was, it was the only thing they found them playing. Uh, and the last thing I'll mention is our region here, the Appalachian Mountain region, this is one of the last places on the planet where people still play them. And uh, so as, as long as I'm still banging on this thing, you know, it's still being played. Um, and I, I was out with my students uh, two weeks ago, walking through the woods and found a piece of wire, bent a piece of rope or uh, a piece of maple, and we made a mouth bow right there. And the students are just like, you just made a stringed instrument out in the woods. And I'm like, yeah, you know, you can do this. So I'm hoping to kind of give this thing a little bit of a rebirth. And I'd love to see what modern musicians would do with it. I mean, if you recorded that and added some effects, you could get some really funky stuff. So I love it. All right, let's transition back to the river and get to um, a few other things I wanted to touch on. I really wanted to sing you a song about the logging hey, area. I know, yeah. Van. I, I know you wanted to keep with your um, with your flow, but Jeff had a, a a question. What is the string? I think historically, stringed instruments and bow and arrow uh, weapons and hunting gear. It was it was gut often. It was often animal, literally the gut, the intestine. I'm using metal, so when I buy chicken wire for my for my garden, uh, it often comes tied together with extra wire and i i don't throw anything out and i'm like one of these days i'll use that wire this is exactly what i used it so the little metal wire that chicken wire comes wrapped in another nice thing about the zoom environment is i i normally i'm a little bit more of a heavy picker a bluegrass player and uh but here it's more intimate and I can do some finger picking, which I normally don't get to do when I'm live because it's quiet. But this is going to make this song sound totally different. I'm pretty excited for this. This is probably my most popular song. It's called The Crosscut Saw. And uh, this song has made me a lot of friends all over, all over the world, really. So um, it's about the log rafting era on the Susquehanna River. And, and please don't, don't zone out. Sometimes when I say that, people are like, oh, I know all about the logging and Williamsport and how they floated logs down the river. That's, that's not exactly what I'm talking about. In fact, uh, to our guests here from Williamsport, uh, as you may know, this is, this is kind of different than Williamsport. Um, this is different than railroads. This is different than canals. And this is different than floating logs down the river. This is when, I might have a picture on the wall. No, I don't. Uh, this is when loggers, farmers usually, would put their logs together in a platform. Well, like fingers on a hand. They put their logs side by side, and then they would attach them. And then they would put another set of logs on the end, another set of logs on the end, and you'd have what's called a platform, but they're all attached is my point. And then they'd have a sweep at the front and a sweep at the back, and they'd navigate down the Susquehanna River to Maryland um, if they could. Now, if you know the Susquehanna River, under all those hydroelectric dams, there's actually some really treacherous water, and a lot of, a lot of watermen died down there in the old days. So what eventually happened is Marietta, Pennsylvania became the destination. That's where the log rafts would go. And then they built the Tidewater Canal, which would then haul the, log, the lumber and logs down to uh, the Tidewater, where they would be used to build ships and in some cases sent all the way over to, uh, to Europe. I don't have it here prepared for tonight, but I have a great uh, sketch, black and white sketch of Pennsylvania Susquehanna River logs being loaded with pulleys up into the hull of a sailing vessel in the in the Chesapeake Bay, and it's obviously on its way back to Europe somewhere where they had decimated their forests. Can you imagine the expense and the work? I mean, to cut a tree in Pennsylvania, float it down the Susquehanna River, get it to the, the tidewater, and then load it into the hull of a ship, sail it all the way back to Europe. I can't imagine what it sold for. You know, meanwhile, we had farmers here who were doing slash and burn agriculture. They're just, these trees were weeds. They were just in Maryland and Pennsylvania. They were just trying to get them out of the way. So that's what this song is about. I hope you enjoy it. 
How about this? When I get done later, not now, get on YouTube and, and watch the video I made for this song. I'm, I'm really excited about some of the black and white footage I, I was able to get from one of my Penn State professors, uh, Richard Pauling. He gave me a copy on a VHS of uh, 1920s hemlock logging in Warren County, Pennsylvania. And to the best of my knowledge, it's never been released. And it's incredible, you know, cross-cut saw, double bit axe, skidding with horses, logging. So I was able to use that for the video of this song, even though the song is supposed to take place right, right after the Civil War. Here we go, a little finger picking. was over, Mr. Lincoln had won. I drew my Navy wages and returned to my home. To Sullivan County where my grandfather came. The soil was rocky and the sky always rained. I remember Grandpa's stories of when he was a kid. A bison in the lowlands and elk on the ridge. But now they're all gone and a new hunt has begun To find the tired dot and Ed make the sawmills hum All I need is my crosscut saw My double bit axe and 80 trees to fall The spring it's coming, I can smell it all around And my soul's being tempted by that high water sound On the loyal sock, it's straight and it's tall. There is pine up there like you ain't never saw. Only brave loggers bear the winter cold. And the snow falls heavy on the Appalachian fold. Well, it's up in the morning at 5 a.m. Throw down some biscuits, some coffee and ham. A 12-hour shift with a Teamster crew Skin logs to the water Through the ice and snow All I need is my cross-cut saw My double bit axe and 80 trees to fall The spring it's coming I can smell it all around And my soul's being tempted by that high water sound Lash our logs together with hickory and oak. No rope, no iron, just pins and bows. A sweep at the front and back and a shack for the crew. 20,000 board feet ready to tie loose. When the ice finally breaks and the water's good and high, we'll head down the loyal sock, our crew of five. A day on the raft down to Montoursville. We hit the Susquehanna where the water's smooth and still. All I need is my crosscut saw, my double bit axe, 80 trees to fall. Spring, it's a coming, I can smell it all around. My soul's being tempted by that high water sound. Once we get to Marietta, we sell off our logs, one hundred dollars split by five river hogs, and we head back north, walking all the way, with a hand on your knife and the other on your pay. Well, if it's a good season, come two or three more runs, then this year is over and summer has begun. I'll watch as the rust, it builds on my tools, and I'll long for the day I'm back with my logging crew. All I need is my crosscut saw, my double bit axe and 80 trees to fall. The spring, it's coming, I can smell it all around, and my soul's being tempted by that high water sound. It's quiz time. Let's look in the chat and see who is listening. So let's see what I can quiz you on. How much money did he sell his log raft for? It said split by five men, but how many dollars? I'm watching the chat to see who heard it. How much money did they get? Hey, Anna got it first. That's right. Uh, now, I'm always cautious when I, when I tell that to an audience or to a group of students. 
like anything, folks, you know, there were good years and bad years, but I find my audiences, they, they want an approximate. They want to leave my program and go, you know, so what do these guys get paid? Um, so a crew of five would often get, in the 1800s, you'd get about $100 a log graph. Well, there were five guys. Usually it was dad and four sons or four son-in-laws or however you want to break it up. It was a family organization. If dad was generous, your cut's what? 20 bucks. And then I always like to ask my audiences, you know, is 20 bucks a lot of money in the 1850s or 60s? You can answer that either way. You know, it, it, how long did it take you to cut the trees, skid the pine down to the river, raft it down the Susquehanna River? Oh, and here's the best part. Guess how you get home from Maryland? You walk home. So now I ask, is $20 a lot of money? You know, I would say from that point of view, no. But when you consider, you know, the coal miners in Shemokin are making 75 cents a day, the iron workers in Danville are making 90 cents a day, you know, a private in the Civil War, and at least for the unions, making like, what, 65 cents a day and a rifle you can keep. Like, it's a lot of money at one time, but no one was getting rich here. So I just like to point that out. Now, I touched on an animal in that song. I said, um, I said, my grandpa told me stories of hunting buffalo. And I worded that carefully when I wrote that song. We had a conversation right before this meeting started. I want to bring you all up to speed. I promised I wouldn't go down that rabbit hole. So I'm just going to bring you to the edge of the rabbit hole. And I'll let you go down it on your own. The question was, were there buffalo here? Um, here's the best way I'm going to answer it. A book recommendation. Get you the whole thing. There it is. This is called The Long Hunt. Um... Death of the Buffalo East of the Mississippi River by uh, Ted Franklin Ballou. Um, this is a superb book, my friends. If you have not read this book, this is, this is probably on my top 10 list of all Pennsylvania and American history books I've ever read in my life. And best of all, he's a very approachable guy. Uh, I believe he's a professor in at Tennessee. All I know is I've written to him and he writes back. You got to love a professor like that. He has an entire chapter on Pennsylvania. And I'm not going to tell you what he says, uh, but I wanted to mention to our guests here from Maryland, you are absolutely confirmed uh, to have had buffalo in Maryland. You did. You definitely had buffalo in Maryland. Pennsylvania gets a little bit more, more blurry. And just for fun, I'm going to leave it at that and move on to the next topic. <laughs> I'm going to switch to the banjo because why not? This is fun. Uh, as, as I'm sure you can relate, there's really no live music happening, or at least it's just starting to happen. Uh, and, and I guess my point is, is I, I, don't, I don't sit around and play music at home very much. My, my practice is when I'm out performing, and uh, that's not something I admit to many audiences, but we're a nice, cozy group tonight. I have to give the illusion when I'm doing some of my more prestigious concerts that I take this real seriously, and I'm out practicing. And the truth is, I take teaching high school very seriously, and I spend uh, a lot of mental time uh, for my students. That's where my brain is focused. And music is just something I've always enjoyed doing. If I can, if I can use it to teach these subjects to all students of all ages, then it's 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 all worth it. But I don't sit home and practice and practice and practice. So I appreciate that you're making me practice my songs because my concert season is about to kick back into full swing, like pre-pandemic all at once. It's like starting in about a week, I have about a hundred concerts, literally about a hundred concerts scheduled this summer. So it's going to get nuts um, real fast. Hey, all I need is an invitation to come down to Maryland. I used to perform at the Cumberland, uh, the, the, the Canal Museum in Cumberland used to have me every year. I got to open up for Kitty Wells, Ralph Stanley. I mean, that, that was one of my favorite gigs. I used to do that with Rich Pauling and the History of Live Boys. And I, I haven't been back to Maryland. Um, is it the, the Catoctin Furnace? Catoctin Furnace, I believe, is a, a group that has asked me to do some virtual programs for them. And I've been doing them and asking, like, okay, now that we're friends, invite me down in person when this stuff's all over. We'll see if they do. I'd love to. But here's a Maryland song for you. This is, um, since our hosts are from Maryland. is a legend. I'm going to let the song tell most of the story, but I just want to give you the backdrop. The backdrop is it's 1811. 1811, the year. 
And uh, the legend is that a, a privateer whose nickname was Blackbeard, not the famous pirate, but another man that went by Blackbeard. And uh, he, was, he was in the business of picking up shipwrecked silver and gold. And the legend that I grew up hearing is there was some silver down in the Chesapeake Bay. It was British silver. And somehow he had an arrangement with the crown that if he could get that silver back, um, he couldn't keep it, but they were gonna give him like a finder's fee. So anyway, the legend is he finds the silver and the War of 1812 breaks out. And there he is in the American Chesapeake Bay with British silver and um, legend has it, he brings it up the Susquehanna River and buries it and hides it till things die down. And as you can guess where this story is going, legend has it, he never came back and got his silver. I don't remember if he died, I don't remember the story. So what did, my, what did I say about my dad earlier and, and proving eel dams are Native American? He says, ask them not to prove it. Or what do he say? I don't know if this silver is real, but I don't know that it's not real. Here's the song. If I had the money of Blackbeard, maybe up on the cinema home, I'd load my canoe with that silver, hey, I'd float the whole way home. But I'd have to go easy at Keating, just below those Mushannon Falls. Ah, but once I got to Renova, I'd have the river all my own. I was never one for dowsing, but hey, what can it hurt? I would trust those copper wires to lead me to pay dirt. I'd stake my claim in some holler off of the beaten path. I'd follow the feel of that captain, for I too have had a beard of black. Now some may say that I'm crazy to believe in this Baltimore tale of British silver sent northward and buried along some trail. But the Susquehanna holds secrets, any riverman can tell you this. It is not a question of if, but when, and brother I'm bound to be rich. But hey, who am I fooling? Me and money never got along. I wouldn't know the first thing of riches or what to do with silver bullion. But I'd like to think if I found it, I would share it with all of my friends. If silver went up, that sent him a home. It's coming downstream in the end. Hey, the banjo. Look, there's even a dog cheering for me. All right, thank you very much, Tina. Uh, the banjo came to America via Africa. Sometimes there's, there's misinformation out there about the banjo. People will say it's an American instrument. Okay, you know, giving it a metal tone ring and, and some of the modern things we've done to it is very American, but this is an African instrument and it came here by enslaved people. And, um, so my introduction mentioned that I've done 28 albums. That changed last night when my 29th album came out and it's called Rap Is Folk. Don't worry, I'm not gonna rap for you right now, but I got dared to make a rap album by my students and I did it. But what I want you to notice is what instrument I'm using on the album. It's a banjo. And here's the thread I draw, I connect for my students. Uh, the banjo was brought here by Africans. And the banjo is the original instrument of the blues and of a lot of the music that I sing um, to this day. And I grew up listening to a lot of folk music and I grew up listening to a lot of rap music. And the earliest rappers were African-Americans. And so I, I wanted to kind of bring this banjo from Africa back into rap. I don't know if it works. The album's only been out for 24 hours, but I had fun making it and I can't wait to see what people think. So if you're brave when we get done here, just tell Alexa to play Rap is Folk by Van Wagner. And you'll laugh when she says my name. It's like she pronounces it like Von Wagner or something. But at least she knows my name. I'll, I'll take that as a win. But 
All right, let's get one more song and then I want to have time to answer your questions. Or no, let's do it this way. It's 7.50. Let's answer questions now and then I'll close with a song. You can either put it in the chat or you can turn your microphone on. Bronwyn, do people have the ability to turn their own mics on? And if so, can we go that route or what's the best way to go? Yeah, they can, they can turn their mics on and ask you a question, sure. Any questions for Van? Oh, Tina has a question. So I want to know how to see these eel weirs for myself. Okay. So as we are talking, I am going to open up something my students have been making for you all. Let's see if oh, I can cool. find. What we did is we got into Google Earth and we, my, my AP, my advanced placement students got into Google Earth and started locating these V's. You can see them on the Susquehanna River. And um, they started putting, let's see my map. They started putting push pins on uh, places on this map where you can see a V. And I have not published this yet, but I'm going to share it with this group because we're all friends here. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is I don't mind if you look at this. I don't even mind if you share it with people. All I must tell you is I haven't like fact checked it yet. I, I kind of, before I went truly public and invited publications to help themselves to it, I wanted to, um, spend a little more time with it, but here we go. Let's see if I can copy and share it with you all. Let's see if it's going to let me put it in the comments. We'll try anyway. There you go. I just put it in the comments. If you click that, your Google Maps should open and you're going to see um, all these blue pins. And I let my students name them after themselves. They were really into that. You know, they were like, well, I can name the site my name. And uh, if you just keep zooming it, pick, pick one and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in. And Tina, what you will see is uh, a V, a very noticeable V of rocks at that site. And... Uh, that's what we use to identify it. And so to, to the to the doubters out there, when I mean doubters, I had I definitely had some folks who saw my video on YouTube and said, like, you're making this claim. This is Native American, you know, like, we're, you know, I think it was of European ancestry. I think Europeans came here from England and they built dams. OK, they did. But look at the sheer number my students found and look where they are. They're right. If, if you know where your Native American village sites are. In fact, that's one of my favorite books, um, Indian Villages of Pennsylvania by, I think, Wallace. And uh, right there in the first cover, you know, it is a map of the known village sites in Pennsylvania. And I mean, it's a dead ringer. The village sites have these V's right out from them. And furthermore, some of those village sites were never later resettled. So I'll use a local example. One of my favorite places to look for arrowheads is called Epler Farms. And to the folks from central Pennsylvania, Leon Epler Farms is kind of between Northumberland and Danville. And there's there's this massive eel dam out there. Even, even if you wanted to believe that it was built by people of English descent in the 1700s, where were they? It would have taken it would have taken an army of English people and no one, you know, there was the Epler family, but I don't know of any sizable town in that area. So these these were certainly Native American connected. That's all we can say. Good question, though. All right, we're going. I'm already planning a road trip in the chat. And you know there's, there's more down there in Maryland. It's a little bit trickier to find them in Maryland. You get deeper water. It's a lot yeah. easier in the shallower water. Cool. Um, Thank Megan you. Had a question. Megan has a question in the chat. Do you, can you, did you see that one? Can no. you talk a little about between the mussel and the eel and the eel's role in mussel restoration and water quality. Yes, I, I'm certainly no expert on it, Megan, but here's what I've been, here's what I've learned. I've learned that there is a native uh, mussel that to complete its life cycle must hitch a ride on the eel um, at some point in its life. And if it can't hitch a ride on a migratory hitch on, on the side of an eel, it's unable to complete its life cycle. And that mussel species was in, in serious decline, um, or I should say still is in, in serious decline, but if we can restore the eels, um, you know, that's that's giving some hope that perhaps we can help the mussel as well. Again, I believe if you, if you check out the Bay Journal, which I have, I just don't have the right issue here, 
the article was in the last few months on Eel Dan's Ad Crable, I believe was the author. I thought that's who it was, but um, they did, they mentioned the muscle. So if you if you can find that article, you'll learn quite a bit about that muscle. And thanks, Anna. I see your comment. Yeah, the Juniata is loaded. I, the, the Juniata River is just covered in eel dams. We, we just couldn't believe how many we were finding down there. Um, All right. Any other questions for Ben? Where are you going to be playing next? Where are your concerts? The easiest way to answer that is if you just Google my name, Van Wagner, um, you might want to throw the word music in there because there is a company called Van Wagner that's in, in New York City that does advertising. That's not me. But uh, if you say Van Wagner music, it'll take in my website. And if you click schedule, you can see the, uh, the opposite of pandemic. Put it that way. I went from having nothing to prop. I probably am overbooked. I just kept saying yes to everything. I was so excited to having gigs coming back. So um my first public appearance in over a year will be this Sunday here in my hometown. I wanted it to be in my hometown, so I'm pretty excited for that. Going to be back in front of people, and I have not heard this sound in, in a long time. <laughs> Did you say your students found close to 150 eel dams? Did I read that right? How I many did they identify? Tell me where you read. I thought I saw it in the chat. I don't yeah, I, I I don't remember. The quickest answer would be I'm going back and looking at that um, map. It tallies it for us, like how many push pins are on the map. Yeah, I'm I'm just doing a quick scroll through it. It's a lot. I don't I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it, it's a lot. Thanks. And you and you you just touched on a really good point. So I was I was recently asked, you know, like what was the whole point of this eels in the classroom thing. Okay, I mentioned earlier that, yeah, stocking a couple eels will temporarily put a few hundred eels in the Susquehanna River, and that's better than zero. Um, but you know what, what this is really all about? It's about raising, I have 150 students every year. Oh. It's not about eels in the classroom. It's about students in the classroom with the eels. And so I got 150 kids that are going to be voters and taxpayers and informed citizens um, that will be... I think way more knowledgeable and aware of this keystone species, which let's face it, you don't need to raise your hands, friends, but I have met quite a few adults that are so generationally removed from eels being a part of everyday life that people didn't even realize there's supposed to be eels here. It's one of those like, really? Like we're supposed to have eels here? Um, and it's it, it, like, I always like saying to my students, if, if we had a time machine, and so here's an if we had a time machine. If we had a time machine and we went back to the 1740s and talked to Chief Shikalimi himself and said, hey, we're from the future. And in the future, there's no shad and there's no eels in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. First of all, he'd say, where's Lewisburg? And the second thing he'd say is, are you kidding me? Like, w w that's an unthinkable universe. Those are two keystone species. I mean, not, not having eels and not having shad is, is like someone from our future coming here and going, in the future, there's no corn and there's no eggs. Like, we'd be like, what? I can't live without those things. Like, it's just, it was such an integral part of life. I like food analogies. I didn't get six foot four by not eating food. So I talk about food a lot. Hey, Van, is it, um, I know that there's the restoration part of it. Are people still um, consuming eels or is there regulations about the, the taking of eels at this point or no to help with the conservation effort? Yeah, so the, the answer to your question is all watershed. In other words, it's not about state lines. It's not about county lines. It's about what watershed you are in. In the Delaware River watershed, you can legally still with the right permits, you can catch eels. I don't know the limit, but you're allowed to catch them. You can smoke them. Um, I have yet to try smoked eel. I've tried other fish that smoked, but I'm told smoked eel is like nothing else. Um, it's supposed to, yeah, I'm seeing some thumbs up. Uh, thank you, Tina. I'm told it's incredible. And so um, I, that is something I have fed my students is smoked shad and, and you can get smoked shad. And I, I wrestle with it because I'm trying to, on one hand, I'm doing a lesson plan on how here locally, we don't have shad anymore. And then, you know, at the end of the class, wait, my, my teacher's feeding me an endangered species? What's going on here? And it's like, no, 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 Th you know, these came from Maryland or Virginia, I forget where we get ours. 
And I try to explain like, you know, there are healthy fisheries out there. The Susquehanna River is not one. What a shame that is. Um, and then we talk a little bit about, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings who's from upriver of me, but if you know Northern Pennsylvania, most of you who are from this area know that the towns are economically depressed upriver of where I teach. When, when you start getting up above Lock Haven and you get into Renova and some of the towns up there, there's just, there's just no employment. And uh, I'm not saying that this would be the silver bullet, but my goodness, if, if eels and shad would come back and people would come and stay in hotels and, and fish and buy gasoline, or in the future, maybe charge their electric cars or whatever it will be. You know, like there, there could be a tourism industry that we're missing out on. The Delaware, the Delaware River has that industry. Anna has a question. Well, it is eight o'clock. Yes, go. Um, hi, I was wondering, um, so uh, what, how do we get them back? Do we have to take the dams all away? I mean, not that that's a bad thing. I'm just saying I can't I, imagine I, I, public outcry. <laughs> I walk a careful, I, I walk a very careful careful road with that with what I'm about because I want to answer your question, but I, I choose my words carefully because I have to point out that one of the biggest allies to funding and helping the eel work that we're doing, you know, are these some of these power companies and mm -hmm. and so. It's not about villainizing them. All I can say is the challenge, the source of the challenge is the dams. That is the source of the challenge. Um, how do we move forward is kind of up to all of us. And, you know, it's, I'm not going to, I'm not going to endorse one over the other, but there are many options on the table. You named one, get rid of the dams. There's also the options of uh, putting more money and research into better fish ladders and fish lifts. You know, some of the fish ladders and lifts we have, they're, they're pretty outdated and they don't work real great, but that's going to cost money. Um, and there's also the option of doing nothing. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of having all the options on the table discussed. And so let's discuss them. And I love that I'm cranking out 150 kids every year from Lewisburg that are going to be part of that discussion because un, un, unless we get the whole population engaged in this, it's not going to move forward. If it's just us environmentalists, people who are going to give up seven and eight o'clock on their Wednesday night to get together and talk about the environment, you know, like we're not going to really move the ball down the court. We need, we need the people who are watching, um, I don't know what do you watch on Wednesday nights. I was going to make a sports analogy, but there's really nothing to watch on Wednesday night, but we need, we need the average public to be engaged in this and see what they want. Um, don't you think so? Yeah. And babe, right before you start, you, you mentioned it, the connection with the Native Americans. Were, do you, did you do any research on eels and um, other parts, how they were integrated into the communities up and down the Susquehanna um, uh, within their culture or anything? Well, I, I love this. The, uh, the, the name Shemokin is, is originally the town of what we call Sunbury. Shemokin means where we catch eels. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a Native American place name. I mean, what, what, what more do we need to know the importance of eels for people than the fact that they named their city after this is where we catch eels? Um, I, I don't know much else for, for, um, to, to answer you except to say there are some place names connected to them. The eel dams are obviously important. I, I do wonder what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Like, did they, did they build their village based on where the good soil was and then build an eel dam or perhaps they built an eel dam where the geology was just right and the river was just the right depth and then you build a village on shore. I, I think that's possible. That's a possibility that I've never heard mentioned or discussed. And um, I, think, I think that's kind of a fun what if. Okay, friends. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to plug a CD. This is not mine. The Middle Susquehanna River Keeper. I bet, I bet you're familiar with the River Keeper Association, but if not, nonprofit. These are folks that, in fact, some of you may be river keepers yourself. Uh, these are volunteers that promote environmental awareness up and down the Susquehanna River. And our local guy, uh, John Zaktans, Tansky, I believe I'm saying it right. John Zaktansky. Forgive me if I got the pronunciation wrong. Um, he had this idea of getting songwriters to, see if I can get the glare away, getting songwriters to submit songs about the Susquehanna River. 
And uh, there are 20 songs on here, and I'm going to close with the song that I donated to the effort. Um, but I haven't had a chance to listen to all 20, but I thought that was a, a it only just came in the mail to me. This is brand new. So if you do some Googling, uh, this is the middle Susquehanna Riverkeeper Association, and they just put out this CD. And uh, this is the song that I donated. It's brand new. Has not been released yet on my own. I, I, uh, I do have a 30th album coming out, and this will be on it, but uh, you're about to hear an unreleased album, or an unreleased song. I think I'll finger pick it. It'll be better. A new song for Old River, a new song for Old River, a new song for Old River Susquehanna Melody. Some folks swim in this river and some learn to float. Some have an inner tube, the lucky ones have a boat. Then again, we all are lucky, floating like a rubber ducky. This river, it might get muddy, but that don't bother us. A new song for Old River, a new song for Old River, a new song for Old River Susquehanna Melody. Some have been baptized in this river, some go to sin. Some walk the river shore and others jump right in. The Baptists and the sinners too have both tripped on a sycamore root. We all stumble a time or two down on the river bank. A new song for Old River, a new song for Old River, a new song for Old River, Susquehanna Melody. If you carry thoughts around the way heavy on your soul, take them to the river shore and let that baggage go. Come all you sons and daughters, this river's got healing waters. Comfort you like a father and mother, hey what a family. A new song for Old River, a new song for Old River, a new song for Old River Susquehanna Melody Guitar. that's bringing out my John Prine right there. That sure feels like I stole a John Prine song. Thanks so much for listening tonight. And uh, if you're a Facebook user, come find me on Facebook and friend me. Um, I, I mean, I have, I have two Facebook entities. I have like Van Wagner Music. I think I'm retiring that one because it's kind of more of a, it's, uh, it's not the same and I can't interact with people. But I have a personal just Van Wagner Facebook account. At, please add me as a friend or re request me as a friend. And uh, I'd love to stay in touch with you. I, po I post a lot of stuff about the Susquehanna and about history. I don't post a whole lot of stuff about politics and stuff like that. I use I use Facebook to reach people about this stuff. So, well, I'll stick around for another last minute if anyone needs to uh, check out and talk to me. But otherwise, thank you so much for the invitation and have a safe return back to uh, whatever whatever your version of normal is. Well, thank you so much, Van. This thank has been you. amazing. We have uh, been so uh, without. Without live music, and this is this is a great um, a, a great uh, a great way a great taste. Thank you so much, um, and your passion and your love for the Susquehanna definitely shines through um, through your music. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Van? Other than that, uh, we'll see y'all soon. Stay to stay safe, stay curious, and stay outside. And we will um, keep, catch us on our, all of our social media to keep up to date with what's going on in the Archaeology Club. Ilka, you want to take us out? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll keep it, try to keep everybody updated. Check our social media pages. Um, and we'll keep you guys informed and have fun with the cicadas. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you very much.